This episode is scripted by John Ruths and Newell Fisher and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 51 in which we will be looking at chapter 49, Hazel Comes Home. Listening back to my attempts at a rural Hampshire accent last week, I think I went on a bit of a tour of most of the West Country in my hoo-doo-doo. I definitely spotted parts of Somerset, Dorset and Wiltshire, and occasionally passed through Hampshire. One piece of borough keeping this week, I've just started a Watership Down podcast group on Facebook to accompany the Facebook page. This feels like the right thing to do moving forward in order to allow easier interaction with listeners, though I'll still be posting on the two Watership Down fan groups as before. There will be a link in the notes. And now... Let's get Hazel Ra home. Chapter 49. Hazel Comes Home. Well, we've been lucky devils both, and there's no need of pledge or oath to bind our lovely friendship fast by firmer stuff, close bound enough. Robert Graves, Two Fusiliers. For the first time in this podcast, I've read out the pre-chapter quote in full because it is one that John Ruth mentioned specifically as a favourite of his when he started helping me out with scripting the podcast. Although his words are used extensively in every episode, I will use his notes on, on it as a quotation on this occasion. It should be easy to see why. Quote, the chief pre-chapter quote is my favourite of the many in this great novel. It is because it has a military nature and I can relate to it. Given the author, Robert Graves, and the French names, it is surely about the First World War but it can really apply to any armed conflict. It is from the first one-third of the poem. It's clear that the two folks that the poem is about have survived their war. To have been lucky devils, not everyone made it. It simply reeks of positive camaraderie, and there is an appreciation for life in the passages. It's the way that nearly every soldier feels at the end of a deployment. To me, it's always been a reference to Hazel and Bigwig. They made it, and no one in the Warren had come as close to death as they each had. I'd also surmise that Hazel is the speaker. Between Hazel and Bigwig, the former has more of a personality to speak the words written, whereas the latter is more of a strong, silent type. Further, the poem could apply to any couple of or set of folks who've simply shared a tough experience where friendship and mutual respect were the results, and it need not be combat. I read this quote for the first time well over 30 years ago, and well before I'd ever set foot in a combat zone. In other words, it can mean a great deal without, without whether you've been to war or not. I've often seen folks in the army inappropriately size up someone who has not been to war. It's almost always pure ego talking, and also what I call hogwash. You can't really blame someone for experiences that they don't yet have. Makes no sense. Moreover, you and I formed a friendship by working together on your podcast. I'd also characterised it this as a shared experience, a book that we both love, where friendship and mutual respect were outputs. A fusil is an old flintlock rifle. So typically, a fusilier is a rifleman, and riflemen are infantrymen, even to this day. The men from the poem did not use flintlocks, but most likely .303 calibre Lee Enfield rifles. Even modern units sometimes have antiquated names because it is a nod to the tradition within a unit. There is still a Royal Regiment of Fusiliers in the British Army, and it's the best example of this that I know. End quote. I absolutely agree, John. Now that reaching, we're reaching the completion of the first goal of this podcast, going through the original novel, there is very much a feeling of camaraderie. I will say a lot more about this when we reach that destination. So, on to the first of the last three post-resolution chapters of Watership Down. The chapter opens with some general comments about Woundwort, pun intended. We'll never know if Woundwort made it or not. The dog certainly got more resistance than he'd likely bargained for. When Richard Adams stated that the dog, quote, unexpectedly scratched and bitten, showed a certain reluctance to come to grips, end quote, I think it was meant to show deference to Windward. Reading this passage closely, I've also realised that I missed another death in episode 29 on death in Watership Down, as the dog killed another Ephraim beside the sentry it killed straight away, and presumably Windward. Before it leaves the down, it finds an Ephraim who was injured by glass on the way to ship Watership Down and kills him. This puts dogs ahead of foxes again and back into second place behind humans as the deadliest allele in the original novel, assuming General Woundwort was killed, of course. You could surmise that Woundwort either made it or was wounded, almost a pun, badly enough to have died somewhere a distance away. We never hear about the dog actually killing him. There is not a body left behind and the dog was also wounded significantly. Again, we don't know for certain, but it, all, it also seemed like Adams liked to end 
that one with a bit of uncertainty, and who can blame him? When Windwater is no longer there to lead, the Afro-Africans basically fall apart. The idea of a renewed attack is not feasible. It was every rabbit for himself, and there was no doubt that these very clever rabbits who stole does from Afrafa and had a seagull working with them also managed to coordinate the arrival of the farm dog to wreak havoc. Most of the Afrafans managed to get away. This effort is led by Campion, who seems to be the holly of Afrafa. He's the only reason why any of the Afrafans made it back, and the going was not easy. Word spreads about Woundwater and the defeat of the Afrafans at Watership Down, and local Alil respond. Rabbits basically disappear unaccounted for on the way back to Ephrafa. Unsurprisingly, this includes the dreaded Vervain. Similarly, once Stalin died, Lavrenti Beria did not last long. All in all, only seven or eight rabbits make it back, a bit under one third of the number that left Ephrafa. I'm sure foxes up their score again in the process, but as these deaths are not documented by Adams, they do not count. Some stay at Warship Down, and they immediately and smartly surrender. Ironically, many surrender to Fiverr, who is not back to himself again, and it is he who talks with Holly and Silver and lets them know that the siege of the Warren is over. With Hazel being away and Bigwig badly wounded, it is easy to imagine either Silver or even more likely Holly taking charge. Those that surrender must wait, though, while our heroes kind of put the Warren back together, and all thoughts are turned towards Hazel and Bigwig, as you might expect. Having successfully made it back to the Warren after leading the farm dog there, Blackberry and Dandelion tell their version of events and let everyone else know what happened at Nuthanger Farm. Being very loyal to Hazel, Pipkin wants to immediately head, to head towards the farm, and Fiverr goes with him. They soon see Hazel. Naturally, Fiverr stays with him while Pipkin goes back to Warship Down to spread the happy news. Hazel makes it back and immediately starts to gather information in order to size things up. After all, he's really missed out on events more than anyone. He talks with Watership Down Rabbit and even Grans Groundsel, the Ephraphan. He asks Holly to take a couple of others with him to scout him out and to make sure that the Ephraphans are really gone. Once again, we see that Hazel possesses a kind of prudence that is a part of the way he leads. He goes to see a very wounded Bigwig. While wound Bigwig is hurt very badly, he does show enough humour to imitate Kiha when asking if Woundwort, quote, is finish. Richard Adams is letting us know that he'll be OK. Bigwig gets up and moves into the now devastated honeycomb. And aren't those words hard to bear? The Warren succeeded brilliantly and has not only survived but defeated Ephrafa. But even winning has its price. Among our rabbit heroes, Bigwig is hurt very badly, almost to the extent that Blackavar was while he was in Ephrafa. We think he'll be OK, but he'll certainly bear the signs of this latest fight. The physical layout of the Warren also pays a price in the form of the honeycomb. This tends to stand out for anyone who really loves this book. When our heroes arrived at Watership Down, they found some rough holes that had already been dug. They proved to be no better than temporary shelter. The real, real Warren must be dug before there are any, any does. The honeycomb is possible due to the tree above it, and due to the fact the group had adopted strawberry, formerly of Cowslip's Warren, a.k.a. the Warren of the Snares, Without their experience in this, in this more or less inside-out warren, and without strawberry, there would be no honeycomb. It serves as a kind of great hall for this warren, so it naturally stings a bit to hear about it being effectively destroyed as a sheltered large underground space. The image used for this episode is supposed to reflect that devastation. Hazel and Bigwig continue to talk, and the latter gets caught up on the result of the second and final raid on Nuthanger Farm. He also learns how Hazel got back. Heisenthal is nearby, hears this, and is suddenly reminded that she saw this in a very Fiverr-like vision while she was still an Afrafan. At the time, a rabbit in a Hrududu made no sense to her. Now it does. We're very near the end of this book now. There are feelings of elation and hope sprinkled here and there throughout the novel. Maybe the most significant was when our hero successfully got away from Afrafa. But any reader was still a bit nervous... When the getaway happens, they still had to get back home and they lose does along the way. Then they do make it back to the Warren. But even at this point, in chapter 41, around 20% of the book still remains. You can't help but think at that point that there will be more conflicts to settle. And of course, there are. We're now just a chapter and the epilogue away from the end. Any closure that takes place can simply be enjoyed by the reader. It's also somewhat bittersweet as the end of the story is just around the next bend in the run. Next time, 
we enjoy a little downtime with the rabbits of Watership Down. Mm-hmm. 